So I recently tested the 11600K on the channel and I found the performance a bit wanting. Now it wasn't terrible, certainly not for the price, but that test was conducted with an MSI Z490 Unified board and something just seemed off, especially with regards to RAM. I've got the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus ITX here to test, so let's go ahead and see if anything changes. Welcome to Machines and More. This Gigabyte Aorus Ultra is a reasonably priced Z590 ITX board. In fact, it's practically the same at retail compared to its predecessor, the Z490 ITX Aorus. Um, I did a double take when I saw the pricing on the other Z590 boards recently, and wow, they're pricey. It's kind of odd to pay more for your motherboard than for your processor. So if you're out shopping for a Z590 ITX motherboard for your 11600K, this one definitely seems like the one to get. So today we'll be taking a look at this motherboard and also revisiting the 11600K benchmarks to see if there's any difference. So if you saw the benchmarks from the 11600K with the Z490i Unified from MSI, I was a bit disappointed with the chip. Um, this was with the newest BIOS available for the board, but the first issue I ran into with that setup was that the 3600 megahertz kit would only post in the so-called gear two mode. And although you typically expect a performance dip from the latency loss compared to gear one, the losses were pretty staggering when I compared the 3200 megahertz kit that would post in both memory gears. Uh, with 11th gen Intel, although memory compatibility has improved, even 3200 megahertz in gear one is technically an overclock unless you're running the 11900K. Although performance was okay, the 11600K seemingly lagged the 10700K in titles it should have at least been on par with, so something just seemed off. But before we get into the selected benchmarks, let's just take a look at this motherboard first. The Z590 Aorus Ultra ITX is Gigabyte's gaming board for 10th and 11th gen Intel CPUs. With this, you'll get a very robust board. It's a thick 10 layer PCB heavy and it features a really nice integrated back shield uh, right here and also an integrated IO shield. Board cooling is all passive, a huge chunk of metal right here over the IO and the power delivery connected by a heat pipe. And there's a small heat fin array here towards the top. Also extends to the bottom with a huge chunk of metal over the M.2 and the chipset. Uh, the board has the same design as the B550 ITX Aorus in the M.2 heatsink, and there's just this groove heatsink piece that uh, fits with a thermal pad over your M.2 drive. But you know this heatsink doesn't touch this metal piece at all. It kind of, uh, there's an air gap underneath. Uh, potentially, this ends up being where the metal piece insulates the heatsink piece and this thing, even though it's got grooves cut out for airflow and heat dissipation, there's kind of no way for air to move through this section, especially with this cover on, and if you have a graphics card on the motherboard, right? So it's a little odd. If you're serious about the M.2 thermals, then I would just say, consider removing the top piece here for ventilation. Now the layout of the board is pretty similar to the Z490 Aorus Ultra. This one is actually one of my favorite aspects of the board. There's something very satisfying about seeing SysFan 1, SysFan 2, and SysFan 3 on an ITX board. And these are all mini headers, so you would just use one of these ad uh, included adapters just to connect to the a standard four pin cable. And unfortunately though, the, the CPU fan header is tucked away next to the eight pin connector. So with this cable in place, it's really hard to reach when it's all built up. And that is really more of a concern if you like to change coolers or cooler fans a lot. But yeah, four fan headers, that's quite impressive. There is another aspect of the layout that is a bit of an inconvenience. The ARGB header is all the way over here by the front audio header, all the way at the bottom, on the bottom left, uh, just right above the PCIe slot, which means it's a really odd cable run. You have an RGB cable going straight across. The internal USB 2.0 header comes courtesy of a dongle, perfect for when your AIO needs a connector, as well as another device, and that just plugs in here on the side here. Very convenient. The board does also have integrated RGB lighting. It's on the edge here at the back underneath the shield, so it's quite subtle. Um, and it has this nice diffusing effect from the backplate shield. 
Power delivery is the strength of this board. It's incredible on this board compared to its peers. This board features a 10 plus one setup with 90 amp ISL 99390 power stages controlled by an ISL 69269 up here. And wow, total overkill for even the 11900K, but hey, I like this. The IO is good. Highlights are this 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port. Uh, it's actually a Gen 2 by 2, which goes up to 20 gigabits per second. Uh, there's three 3.2 Gen 2 A ports, also a front Gen 1 Type-C header, Wi-Fi 6, uh, 2.5G Ethernet, fairly standard for high-end boards now, but this is a very impressive board overall, headlined by the power delivery. So for testing, I popped in the same 11600K with the 3200 MHz RAM kit set to XMP and Gear 1 to start. And was the performance better than when tested with the Z490? Surprisingly, yes. Uh, with R23 multi-core, the score is immensely higher. Same thing with the uh, single core tests. And with 3 d Mark's Time Spy's CPU score, the score saw a sizable increase. Now, I only had time to test one game against the previous benchmarks, but these synthetics translated to a meaningful increase from the Z490 numbers for gaming FPS for both 1080 and 1440 in Red Dead 2. Now, that's great, but the reality is it still only manages to more or less match the 10700K, and the 5600X is still faster overall. But these are much better numbers for the chip. For Blender, the render time saw a massive jump, which more or less matches the 5600X. The interesting thing to note was that all core clocks for the renders were identical. Both boards boosted the CPU up to a consistent max at 4.6 gigahertz for stock turbo. At that point, there were some differences in how much voltage this board gave the processor versus the MSI. This one gave it a much more reasonable 1.26 volts. A quick check on VRM MOSFET temps shows nothing to be concerned with at all. Not that we'd expect there to be any problems with this good of a power delivery setup. So with that, I do think the 11600K is a bit better than I gave it credit for initially. Certainly at this point, it still doesn't look impressive on its own necessarily, but still quite worthy against the 5600X now. Of course, it does come with a hefty power draw. And actually, I do think a lot of the odd early performance benchmarks you're seeing elsewhere may be related to memory latency. With the Z490, I think most likely the issues were memory latency related. And the kicker was that on this Z590 board, the CPU had absolutely no problem posting with the 3600 megahertz kit on gear one something that MSI board was absolutely not able to do. Granted, with the 3600 megahertz kit, the differences were pretty small, but they do test better in synthetics and gaming, particularly for the 1% lows here, and I think enthusiasts can appreciate that. The other thing I noticed was that the drop off from gear one to gear two wasn't as severe with this board. And of course, the gear one to gear two comparison on the Z490 had to be done with the 3200 megahertz kit, but I get the feeling that something is either wonky with the latest stable BIOS for the MSI board, or there is actually something odd with Z490 and the memory latency on Rocket Lake. At any rate, if you're going for a Rocket Lake setup, I'd wholeheartedly recommend going Z590 anyway, if you can, it's a newer chipset. And especially for ITX, this Z590 board is priced about the same as the Z490 ITX Aorus. In fact, a little bit better when I checked just now on Amazon. So it's kind of a no brainer if you're shopping between those two boards. Against the other Z590 ITX boards, I see absolutely no reason to pay more. And I think this is the go-to in this category. Heck, get this board for your Comet Lake S setup too. I love the looks, the power delivery and the board cooling. This board loves the dongle life, and except for a few layout quirks, this might just be the perfect ITX board for 10th and 11th gen Intel. So that'll do it for the review today. Thanks for checking in. Please like, links for the board, and other components down below. Please subscribe, and I'll see you again soon.